Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's GT News webinar, Expanding Globally, Treasury Optimization Through New Technologies, proudly sponsored by Axletree Solutions. Before we begin, please listen to the following housekeeping points. If you experience any technical difficulties, please type them into the Q&A panel located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Your message will be responded to immediately. Additionally, questions for the speakers and panelists should also be typed into the Q&A panel. We will address as many as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please ensure to send your questions to all panelists. Finally, this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss anything or think a colleague would be interested, you will be sent a link to access this recording within the next week. I'd now like to hand you over to our first speaker for today, Mr. Franklin Van Wieseldonk. Welcome, Frank, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Sarika. Hello, everybody. I'm Frank Van Wiesendonk. I'm Chief Marketing Officer of Axle Tree Solutions, who's co-hosting this webinar with GT News. So, also on behalf of Axle Tree Solutions, welcome to the webinar. The webinar is titled Expanding Globally. Treasury Optimization Through New Technologies. As we know, globalization is reaching new levels. Uh, it's only a decade ago, apart from the very largest multinationals, that many companies restricted their international activities to only a few countries. A company could be supported with just a few banks, whereas today, both sales and sourcing in multiple countries is really it's a business reality for all but the smallest companies. This has many implications, and just two of such consequences are, well, firstly, individual companies have an increased number of bank relationships. This enhances the value of streamlining the financial telecommunications through a single channel, for example, through SWIFT. And secondly, with increasing complexity in the treasury arena, more and more companies are shedding their old Excel spreadsheets in favor of modern treasury management systems. And here at Axel3, we focus on these two areas as a SWIFT service bureau and at the same time offering our treasury management solution called Treasury Tree. As for our speakers today, uh, we have three speakers who come from different perspectives, a bank, a non-bank corporate, and a technology service provider. First, we'll speak Carrie Anderson, who is Vice President and Senior Product Manager of PNC Bank, or more formally, the PNC Financial Services Group. Carrie will provide a bank's perspective of SWIFT for corporates. Next will be Margaret Albrecht, who is Vice President and Assistant Treasurer of First Data Corporation. From a corporate perspective, Margaret will share how First Data experienced putting in place their SWIFT connection all the way from connectivity to straight through integration. Margaret will be followed by Mohan Murali, president of Axletree Solutions. Mohan will present some of the cutting edge technologies that are offered today to treasury operations in the form of state-of-the-art treasury management systems. So with that, let me pass the presentation over to Kerry Anderson of PNC. Thank you, Frank. Good afternoon, everyone. So our session today will cover what you as a corporate need to know about going global with your business, what you can expect from your banks in that process, a little bit about what uh, some others are doing uh, in that regard, and then the tools and technologies and the options that are at your fingertips to help you expand your business globally. Let's begin by considering the trend of U.S. companies doing business abroad. According to the 2014 AFP Strategic Role of Treasury survey that was just published this past June, three out of five organizations either have operations outside of the U.S. or conduct business with customers and vendors overseas. Among larger corporations with annual revenues of a billion or more, 72% either have overseas operations or conduct global commerce. Well, well, 43% of smaller organizations do so. 
placed another way, 77% of publicly owned organizations have global operations compared to 53% of privately held businesses that do. So while this expansion into markets around the world provides a lot of great opportunity, the need for corporations to manage treasury functions from a global perspective presents many challenges as well. Often, when companies expand to new markets through acquisitions rather than organically, there can be a gap in understanding of local market practices and regulations that impact your business and the tax implications of accounts in new regions. Additionally, when new markets New markets can be confusing when it comes to even basic functions, like opening bank accounts, which we've seen particularly in high growth areas like China. Beyond that, the more bank relationships and accounts that a company has, the more difficult it can be to get consistent visibility into all of your cash accounts to manage cash cohesively across the organization. Treasury needs easy in initiation for all payment types as well in multiple regions either through a single portal or with transmissions via your bank. Without good global cash visibility or easy, consistent funds transfer capabilities, liquidity management can become fairly ineffective. From a technology perspective, bank connectivity, whether that's by transmissions or bank portals, becomes more complex as the number of relationships and services grows. And to top it all off, the need to manage risk particularly the risk involved with exchange of financial data, seems to be ever-increasing. So now, what role can your banks play in support of global corporate expansion? Indeed, establishing the right banking relationships in the countries where you do business can greatly simplify your international activity. Often, you can look to your banks to provide regional and regulatory expertise. For instance, regarding SEPA payments or use of an IBAN for payments. Corporates can also lean on their banks for assistance with opening in-country accounts. And banks support this in two primary ways. The first is with the branch model. And this is typically an approach maintained by the large global banks who've established their own branch network in multiple regions and countries throughout the world. But you should be aware that not all branches of a bank may support all services needed in each region. Sometimes there are distinctions in which branches offer trade or FX or cash management services, or a branch may only support certain types of clients. So it's important to be clear on that up front with each bank. The second way that banks support treasury services around the globe is by maintaining a global network of correspondent relationships with other banks. This gives you, the corporation, access to accounts and services across an entire network of banks. These correspondent relationships can include things like service level guidelines between the correspondents so that they maintain a consistent level of quality across the board. And your local bank may provide you with assistance with opening the account, uh, working through the documentation on your behalf to open accounts with their correspondents. Or they may simply refer you to the appropriate contact of the correspondent and facilitate the introduction, perhaps obtaining initial documentation, but then you would work directly with the correspondent bank. Now, beyond account opening, some banks also provide online banking portals for their corporate clients to facilitate treasury management services across accounts held around the world, whether those accounts are with the portal provider or with another bank. These multi-bank services include functionality like consolidated transaction and balance reporting from all domestic and global accounts. Typically, that's managed by uh, the delivery of the SWIFT MT940 reporting to the consolidating bank. This enables a single consolidated view of the daily cash position in one online portal. For cash flow management, some additional capabilities may include automated global cash concentration which can be based on company-defined rules or funds transfers among your bank accounts globally, both of which enable companies to better manage liquidity from a global perspective. Additionally, some portals incorporate forecasting tools so that you can anticipate activity and plan funds flow among your accounts. These multi-bank services 
portals are particularly useful when a company has accounts with banks that can provide swift reporting, but don't, those banks don't necessarily support corporate access. So you can't receive swift reporting directly from all of your banks. In that case, those banks that can transmit the 940s to the consolidating bank, which provides the portal, and therefore you get a, a consolidated view of your account. Now, of course, SWIFT has become a, a prominent way for banks to assist corporate treasurers with managing their accounts globally. Think of SWIFT as another channel alongside online banking portals and file transmission that enables connection with all of your banks via a single, highly secure network. SWIFT may historically have been appropriate mostly for global multinational corporations, but it's now less costly and far easier to implement than it was originally due to SWIFT's cloud-based solution, Alliance Lite 2. Ultimately, the primary consideration, though, of whether or not SWIFT is right for your company is not the size of your corporation, rather the number of bank relationships, and therefore the level of complexity in your bank connectivity. When considering which banks may provide the best support for your global business via SWIFT, first look for those that have strong support for SWIFT messaging services. And this includes uh, both the MT messages, like the SWIFT MT940, which is a prior day bank statement, or an MT101, which is a SWIFT formatted payment instruction. But also via File Act, a SWIFT file-based messaging service that enables you to send and receive data files in any format through the SWIFT network. It's important to know that not all banks that support corporate access through SWIFT support file access. So again, you'll want to be clear about that with your banks as you begin. It's also important to know which banks support an assortment of data formats uh, for various treasury functions, such as payments, trade, or FX. So this includes both the MT formats that I was just discussing, uh, the 100 series and 900 series, but also uh, MT. 300 for FX confirmation, MT798, which is a kind of broad trade envelope, if you will. And then beyond the SWIFT MT messaging are the newer XML-based standards that fall under the umbrella of ISO 20022, uh, which is gaining a lot of prominence as a global standard. And often uh, corporations uh, begin to consider adoption of ISO standards as they move to new ERP applications which use ISO as their native language, if you will. Some banks have adopted SWIFT's new value-added service called MyStandard, which provides a single portal for the bank to publish all of their formatting specifications to their corporate clients, which is intended to ease the corporate implementation of, of data exchange with their banks. And my standards additionally provide the ability for a corporation to self-validate their test files for that bank. So you, you get the specs online, you create your test file, and then you can validate if you've created a valid file in the utility. And last, many banks provide a data translation services uh, that can help increase interoperability between these industry standards and any proprietary formats that your backend systems may have. Now, uh, to assist corporations with identifying the banks that, that support corporate access via SWIFT, SWIFT has created a, a bank readiness certification, which is essentially their seal of approval that the bank has de a defined SWIFT corporate implementation process, uh, solid documentation of that process, and knowledgeable trained staff. It's important to note that SWIFT also provides certifications for application vendors as well as service bureaus, the latter of which is called the Shared Infrastructure Program, or SIP. Service bureaus have, that have attained the premier level of SIP certification have the same level of resiliency and disaster recovery that SWIFT has, which should give you a high level of confidence working with that service bureau. And lastly, it's important to be aware of your bank's engagement with the SWIFT community, uh, such as participation in the various committees that SWIFT facilitates. Uh, 
for instance, the U.S. National Group, which is a, a national group focused on uh, consolidating the standards and, and improving the standards from a global perspective. Or CGI, the Common Global Implementation, which maintains a series of working groups to support further standardization of ISO 20022. So those are my comments on the bank perspective of expanding globally. And with that, let's turn the conversation over to Margaret Albrecht for Data Corp to share the experience of her Treasury's global expansion and adoption of SWIFT. Thanks, Carrie. Um, that's a great perspective from PNC, um, who's a fabulous partner of ours. Uh, this is Margaret Albrecht. I'm the Vice President and Assistant Treasurer for Treasury Operations for First Data Corporation. Uh, if many of you, um, many of you might know us, we're a, a big credit card processor. But as we expand our business, we're kind of becoming, um, uh, you know, a full payment solutions uh, corporation. I've been here four years and. Um, Shortly after joining the company, I was introduced to the SWIFT concept at an AFP uh, conference in San Antonio, and uh, we decided to take on the challenge. And I broke out the uh, project in a couple phases. And phase one was primarily domestic, and we completed that in 2013. Uh, we are receiving probably 99% of our domestic prior day, current day, and month end bank statements via uh, SWIFT. And we chose a service bureau, Axeltree, who will be speaking in a while, to um, serve as our connectivity. Um, and there were multiple reasons for that. Uh, two of the main reasons were we didn't want to have the direct connect infrastructure and um, because of it's a, it's a very large expense and we didn't want to have the expertise in-house. Number two was um, even though we're not transmitting um, PCI data, you know, cardholder data over these lines, uh, any communication in, in or out of our company is held to those PCI standards. So our IT group um, required that we had a T1 line, and that was um, uh, Axeltree or the Service Bureau uh, Avenue was the only way we could use a T1 line. So uh, we have been online for over two years and uh, it's been going very well. Um, we also received the EDI uh, month end statements. So the prior day, current day come in uh, daily via, via um, file act. So even though uh, you know a bank would send a normal BAI file over you know NDM or another connection, what we chose to do was to move all of those to a SWIFT file act file. So we get all of those daily through file act. Um, some banks can't do file act, so they send, send MT940s, which are prior day statements. And then we get the EDI month end and the month end bank statements uh, via file act also. We started uh, doing MT-101s uh, close to a year ago, and um, that's been very successful for us. Um, as you may or may not be aware, we move uh, not only for STATA money, but we move money for all of our um, alliances, you know, all the major banks that we do business with and process their credit cards. So those fiduciary funds um, are moving all throughout the day. Although we don't move a lot of those fiduciary funds via um, SWIFT, we do get all of the bank reporting uh, to set our cash positions through SWIFT. 
so that was phase one, uh, really very successful and um, saved us about $1.2 million a year in direct access uh, bank fees. Phase two was, is really where we're looking globally. Um, a project kind of popped up out of the blue um, before I was able to really conquer my international um, needs, and that was uh, our UK division had an alliance with a bank, and we had to move uh, an international bank. So we had a domestic bank processing our um, MT101 payments to our European partners, and um, we had to move that to a UK bank. The UK bank did not want to do the MT101 conversion as the US bank had previously done for us, which at first was a little disheartening for us, but then we realized um, how much we were paying to have that conversion, and as we introduced, um, or as I introduced Axeltree to the uh, our alliance group, it became clear that that might be a, a good process for us to go through. So basically what we were trying to do was take a flat file from a um, alliance and convert those payments into MT-101s so the UK bank could just grab them and send them. Um, we, of course, did not have this expertise in-house, and when the project kind of bubbled up to me, it needed to move fast. I think we really needed to go live within three months. So once we started looking into it, um, I learned a lot in this process. First, uh, I thought the group could just use the BIC, which is the Business Identification Code, with SWIFT that we used um, for my d domestic business. But what we soon found out, this UK bank, I was um, receiving MT940s uh, from already and doing some MT101 payments uh, for another business through that bank. So the UK bank was, you know, basically said we can't take the same BIC and um, point it to cert, you know, different accounts for different processes. So we understood pretty quickly we needed to uh, get a unique BIC for this alliance. Um, the new payments, as I mentioned, couldn't be processed the way the U.S. bank was doing them for us, so we needed a translation and we needed it quickly. Um, and then we also needed to have some kind of confirmation come back from the UK bank telling our accounting group here in the US that the payments were made. So that confirmation in SWIFT lingo is a MT910. And once the MT910, when we saw the sample of it, our uh, U.S. group was like, well, our recon system can't read that. So we needed not only a translation to the U.K. bank to do an MT-101, but we needed a translation back to the um, U.S. group uh, telling us that the confirmation, you know, reading the confirmation for us. So I... I apologize, there we go. I was trying to go to the next slide. Um, so since we had the relationship with Axeltree, we were, um, you know, the communication was, was in place, and as I mentioned early, earlier, that um, our security is extremely high, and um, Axeltree has to jump through hoops constantly to prove that they're a secure group. Um, all the communications were in place. We were able to obtain a new BIC very quickly. Um, if any of you have gone through the process to 
receive a BIC, you have to apply, and it takes a bit of time, I think probably four weeks or so to receive one. Um, although we are a, a company with publicly traded um, bonds or debt, we are not a publicly traded company, so we had to find a bank to be a sponsor for our original BIC. So just keep that in mind if you're not a public company. But since we had our BIC, it was faster and much cheaper to get a sub-BIC. So we did that for the UK Alliance. And um, again, we needed to um, get Axletree involved to set up the MT-101 conversion and then the MT-910 conversion. So the way we went about that is we gave Axel Tree the flat file produced by our U.S. group, and they put together a proposal on what it would take to convert that and started sending test files. So again, the, the fact that we had established all the communication up front and we had a good working relationship with Axel Tree, things went uh, fairly smoothly. And we, I think we tested for about three to four weeks. And, um, you know, uh, as usual, the, the toughest part of a project is the change management piece. So, um, you know, working with my groups in uh, the U.S. and in the U.K. to understand uh, really what Axeltree's role was and you know who they went to if there there wasn't um, correct information transmitted. You know, is it the bank? Is it Axletree? Or is it the U.S. group? So uh, it, it went very well, and um, we are we have been live for quite a while. Um, you know, I, I believe the communication is very clear on who needs to handle what. Um, the groups have been happy with the results. And um, what I'm real excited about is it's kind of proven now for international payments. So as I um, look internationally, we're consolidating our payment structure internationally. We have about 26 banks we uh, send accounts payable through internationally, which is way too many. So we are uh, kicking off a project or trying to kick off a project with our international partners to streamline that and, um, uh, you know, probably using close to the same model uh, we used for this alliance group. So I like the... I like the way we put this together because it's um, helping us to, I, I hate to use the word bank agnostic because, um, you know, my bank relationships are very important to me, but sometimes there are things that happen in the world that prevent you from staying with a bank or because of some security issues or, you know, you need to move quickly. So what I've liked about this is the conversion wasn't written to a bank standard. It was more to a SWIFT standard and our ability to move to another bank, um, in my opinion, will be much easier uh, in the future. So um, those are my quick comments. I am going to pass the presentation over to Mohan who I've been working with um, for three years or so at Axeltree. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I really appreciate it. It was a good overview of your growth and your plans to expand. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Mohan Murali, President for Axeltree Solutions. Uh, just a quick background. Uh, I've been involved with SWIFT since 1995 in various roles as partner and it's been a pleasure and a good journey getting to understand the technological changes that have happened. And in the last few years, I got a good insight into what it takes for a corporate to look at global expansion 
be it in terms of um, banking requirements, uh, documentation requirements, or just simple technology requirements. As corporations expand globally, technology is the key uh, instrument or the key player that's going to make a difference between a successful rollout or issues. Uh, fortunately, uh, the tools, the technologies, and the solutions available out there are well established and mature and can be leveraged for a very quick rollout globally. When corporations expand globally, the first thing they need to see is how they are going to connect to all their banks. So streamlining the con connections to the banks is very, very important. And uh, this is where I'm very excited that SWIFT has been able to build and convincingly prove to the industry that they come out as a de facto standard when it comes to streamlining bank communications. Why? Because the SWIFT connectivity, which is used by all the banks globally that you would, a corporate would possibly be connecting to, is a secure, reliable, resilient, and a trustable network. And there are multiple ways to connect it. And the security is among the highest that you can see. The reliability, is far anything else. And of course, it's the highest resilient network that I have come across in my so many decades of working. And to connect into the network, there are several methods, but uh, more importantly, what does the streamlining bring to you? On the chart, you would see different methodologies used to connect to banks by different groups within the organization, and also different entities across different parts of the world uh, use. Uh, a wide variety of methodologies like FTP, SFTP, direct host-to-host -host connection, sometimes bank portal, etc. And when you're looking to grow global, these are hindrances to getting the data in a timely fashion, having a control, auditable control on the processes, and being able to report on the global growth. So is able to consolidate all the communications through a single standardized gateway and then get you access into all your global banks as you expand and build new relationships. That's the first step to expanding globally from a technology standpoint. The next thing is once you start expanding, once the corporates start expanding, they need to take into consideration the security as well as compliance. Security of who is going to have access to what accounts, is, is that uh, person authorized, authenticated, is the person still there? And so many so so many different information is expected from a compliance department. At the same time, when new relationships are opened with new banks, there's a lot of documentation that has to be provided. Signatory information, passports, uh, government IDs, so on and so forth. So the tools that I would like to really bring about here is one is the SWIFT 3S key which, if you look at the graphics, takes away the burden of what I call as banking in a bag. It's not my term. Somebody gave it to me. Banking in a Ziploc bag containing a lot of different keys, fobs, and uh, tokens can get replaced using the SWIFT 3S key solution into a single token that's issued by a bank but certified by SWIFT as a certification authority. There are a couple of other... Um, Certification authorities, identrust is another common one people know. But given that you're consolidating the solution or looking at consolidating everything using the SWIFT network as your channel for bank communication, a 3S key is a plugin that will work seamlessly with this model. SWIFT so recently launched the KYC registry, which I think is a fabulous development. Now, corporates can have a centralized point of reference, as well as banks can use that reference to have control over what data they need to get, what data is being distributed to the corporates, who has got access to it, and if there are changes to the data that can be seamlessly updated in a single location and can be distributed in a very controlled fashion. So the combination, and there are several other technologies out there, but to me, these two are very key in ensuring security and compliance to what data is going out and where it is going out, and who's got access to what accounts. But once you go to opening an account, uh, many of you may have heard, many of you may be 
involved in the recent uh, rulings with regards to foreign bank account reporting. So if a U.S. entity has a U.S. person as a signatory on a bank account that's outside of the U.S., they have to report back to IRS uh, in June with that information. Can everybody have uh, full control over it? All the accounts that are out there in the world, it's a difficult task to do. But then, Bank Account Administration and this um, offering of EBAM, along with FPAR reporting tools, can help you to ensure there's account control and proper reporting, which is one of the critical points when you look at uh, going global. And when you look at, uh, there's a question here I would like to take. Uh, I see the benefits of SWIFT for a carpet. How are our firm could then also benefit by making our existing bank account structure more efficient? My instinct is to tackle the account structure first before implementing SWIFT. The answer to that is they are simultaneously running activities. There are a lot of questions. Should SWIFT come first? Should account structure come first? Should TMS come first? And depending on how you want to lay out your rollout, your plans, uh, having the account structure being uh, normalized at the same time while you're establishing the SWIFT connectivity is very critical to ensuring account control. Account control obviously will mean you have to define your banking relationships. Define your before you do your banking relationship is your global entities, and then after the global entities are in place, defining what bank relationships they have, what are the accounts that those banks have, what are those accounts used for, and then subsequently who the signers are and what are the limits. So it is the way you approach the project would vary, but uh, from the perspective of this slide is account control and reporting as part of a critical component when you're looking at expanding globally. It is a key point to consider, and there are solutions out there with SWIFT and outside of SWIFT that will allow uh, corporations to manage account control and reporting. SWIFT is a key enabler, but we are looking at what are all the key technology requirements that you need when you're looking to expand globally. So we discussed the consolidation of all your bank communication, then managing your account controls, your security, your compliance, and finally, what's all this for? It's for visibility, being able to report to your management how your global operations are looking, giving visibility to the cash, controlling the cash that's out there as you expand your business globally, managing all the debts and investments that go with global, invest, uh, global expansion, and finally, as you add more banks, there will be fees associated with that. So how would you report all of that? How will you have visibility to all the activities and build reports? Is also where the TMS comes into picture, and you would possibly look at um, technologies that will help, uh, like dashboards, uh, Excel sheets, um, treasury management solutions, and other applications that will help you manage the visibility to cash, manage visibility to forecasting the balances, as well as reconciling all the debits, credits, and through all the statements that comes in. So in short, when you are looking at expansion globally, you need the banks to help you define what they need and be able to understand your needs as well as mapping it to what the bank offers you. So there are certifications that SWIFT gives you for banks readiness. At the same time, You've seen how corporates are able to leverage uh, once they have established the connection, how it's easily they can replicate the process to expand globally. And finally, there are tools and technology out there, like uh, SWIFT being one of the premier ones here, that has solutions along with third-party solutions like the dashboards and treasury management screens that you can get from treasury management vendors to look at monthly balance reporting cash reporting, daily cash reporting, as well as all your other ex executive reports that are required by your management. So at the end of the day, when you look at the banks, the corporates, and the technology, going global is definitely uh, easy to handle task, and there are peers who can uh, guide you, there are experts who can guide you in how to go about at this point in time. So at this point in time, I would like to open the floor to questions.
Question and answers. All right. Thank you so much, Mohan, um, and Kari and Margaret for your insightful presentation. Now is certainly the time for any questions from the audience. Once again, if you do have questions, please type those into the Q&A panel, which you can find on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We do have a question that has come in. So the person says they see the benefits of SWIFT for a corporate. However, their firm can also benefit by making their existing bank account structure more efficient. Their instinct is to tackle the account structure first before implementing SWIFT. Would the presenters agree with that? Um, this is Margaret Albrecht, and um, I'd like to comment first. Uh, that is, I think, critical to the success of any um, SWIFT Im implementation. Um, not only to review your bank structure, but understand who is accessing your bank information and for what purposes. Um, a big bang we got out of our project was uh, reducing the number of people who had online access. We actually had an internal audit um, finding that uh, we had they were upset about the number of people we had accessing our bank accounts. So that was another big driver in our SWIFT project. We needed to get the same information from the bank and put it out where numerous people could see it uh, without them having direct access to the bank. So even though most of those users, I mean hundreds of users, could see um, just bank reporting, you know, they couldn't do wires or anything, our audit, internal audit still felt it was a risk. So not only do you want to look at your account structure, but you need to understand who needs bank information and why, and hopefully stream that down a bit. Would anyone else like to chime in? All right, so moving on to our next question. What is the process for getting banks to send an MT940 transmission to another bank where we have visibility? This is Carrie Anderson. Um, I would say that varies a little by bank by bank. Oftentimes you can look to your lead bank uh, where you're going to have all of the 940s delivered to, uh, and, and they can facilitate that, that conversation for you. But um, know that each bank that you have accounts with will require you as the owner of the account, your company as the owner of the account, to provide authorization to deliver uh, statement information via 940. So it's kind of a partnership, but oftentimes the lead bank can take lead for you on those conversations with the other banks. Another question that we had is, um, someone mentioned having a BIC for U.S. and a sub-BIC for European banking. Why do you need that sub-BIC? Yeah, this is Margaret again. So I'm sorry was, if I wasn't clear about that. So we um, had a U.S. BIC um, that we initially um, created for the business um, I kicked off domestically. Along with that, I was doing MT101 payments and um, receiving MT940s via that BIC for a UK bank. So when our the UK project came up with our alliance in UK, they needed to access different a different business entity at the UK bank. So the UK bank said, hey, we can't see this BIC come in and say you need to access two different businesses. So if um, the alliance, if there was an alliance and it would 
have been purely uh, FDC business, then I could have used the same BIC, but because it was a whole different business structure at the UK bank, they, they said they couldn't um, have it touching two different businesses, um, you know, legal entities. So I hope that makes sense. Thank you, Margaret. So someone would like to know, how does one determine the optimal model? Is there a demographic Venn diagram or some sort of matrix based on business size and or location? This is a question I think Margaret could be better able to handle. Uh, my interpretation of an optimal model, I think it's a business model where uh, it is, a question could be expanded, that would be nice, but uh, maybe Margaret can have a go at it. I was going to suggest you answer it, Mohan. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think... Um, you know the number of banks. If you're if you're pulling data from over five banks, um, it, it could be very useful. If you have multiple bank accounts internationally, um, it's very useful. Um, I have you know some diagrams I've created you know just to sell it internally, which. You know, I'd be happy to share if anyone wants to reach out to me directly after. And this is Carrie. I would just add to Margaret's comments or, or echo the general rule of thumb for a corporation to consider direct SWIFT connectivity has been, and this is not hard and fast, but maybe four to six banks that you have to maintain connectivity with. Um, that's really like the baseline that you'll start to see a positive cost-benefit evaluation of migrating from direct bank connectivity to the, the SWIFT corporate model. Uh, but that is really a corporate-by-corporate -corporate analysis of what your current cost structure is to maintain your current environment. Great. So we have a few more questions about BIC. Um, going back to that discussion, someone would like to know what your recommendation for a company with large USD receipts um, but with multi-currency banking accounts and in-currency bank accounts, what, they, what approach they should use. Well, um, again, SWIFT is just a messaging system, so you can send um, messages in it, you know, regarding any currency. Um, so um, I would say, I mean, even though I, I call it a U.S. BIC, that really just was identified by where I'm located. It's not, um, you know, I could send any currency through that BIC. So I hope that answered the question. Um, Carrie or Mohan, do you have anything to add? No. No. Okay. Someone else would like to know how does Swift Alliance Light 2 differ in terms of the Swift proposition when it comes to other connectivity options? Does Light 2 have any restrictions in terms of supporting the volume? This is on. Go ahead. You want to take that, Mohan? Yeah, you go ahead, Kenny. Okay. Uh, as the name implies, there was a Swift Alliance Lite 1, <laughs> and that original version did have some restrictions on some volumes and message types that were supported, but the new Lite 2 does not have any such restrictions. Any kind of volume, any file size, any type of message can be delivered through Lite 2. And it can also be fully integrated and automated for connectivity to your backend systems, your ERP or your accounts payable, accounts receivable systems. Uh, Light 2 could be fully integrated. And they also have an additional module that called Converter that, again, if you want uh, to use a Swift utility, it can uh, 
connect from Light 2 and, and translate your data to proprietary format. So Light 2 has uh, fully appreciated some of the constraints in Light 1, and they've, they've all pretty much been addressed in Light 2. Yeah, and this is Margaret. Um, we were on Light 1, just uh, I, I knew up front it wasn't going to solve all of our needs, but I used it just to learn more about SWIFT. Um, Light 2 was not available when we went live, but one of the restrictions we had is that uh, it's only through FTTP uh, connection. So our IT group would not allow that. So, but I think that's probably pretty rare. Um, but that that's one of the main reasons we didn't go down that path. Again, uh, this is Mohan here. On the light too, it depends on what your organization needs. If it is uh, connectivity that's uh, straightforward and security is not an issue, you want direct, you could do that. Again, one size does not fit all, and you have to review everything, talk to peers, look at the users of Light2, talk to them, look, talk to service bureaus, and understand and come to a decision that's suitable to your organization. Thanks, Mohan. So we still have about four minutes for any questions. So certainly keep typing those questions into the chat panel. If we do not get to your question today, um, the questions will be responded to by email afterwards. So also, in the same vein of the Swift Alliance light conversation, someone else would like to know the advantages that a Swift Service Bureau provide over a Swift Alliance light. No, well, this is Mohan. Service Bureaus have been in industry for a long time, and uh, Swift has got certification for service bureaus. The service bureaus are required to comply with certain very tight, strict guidelines and have all the resiliency and backups and certification to ensure that they can deliver the same level of service uh, that is expected out of SWIFT. So the difference of advantages of service bureaus or like to would vary based on the service bureau you're talking, and it can always be taken offline depending on what you're looking for. In some cases, it could be certain solutions like uh, reconciliation or others that may not be there on Light 2. Right. Um, this is Margaret again, and um, I see another question that kind of ties into it. Under Axle Tree Service Model, who performs the activity to onboard bank service providers for MT940, MT101, et cetera? So this kind of ties into the uh, question on the differences. Um, because our company was so global and um, we had no in-house expertise on SWIFT and our IT group um, did not want their hands in it, um, at the time the Service Bureau made the most sense. Um, and then as we kind of went down the road, it became very important to me that I didn't have to be the expert either. So that's how I built my relationship and kind of how I build my relationships with my banks is that um, I go to them a lot and ask for their assistance because um, I honestly I'd rather have uh, that kind of work be done outside my department. We're very lean and um, I'd rather say, okay, I need this from A to D and then take it to Z. Uh, in the next two months rather than trying to find resources here. So it, it kind of matters on your internal infrastructure and how much IT support you have. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, what are the panelists, what are your views on cloud solutions launched in the market by ERP vendors? Uh, Margaret? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yes. Cloud solutions, is that? 
specific to SWIFT connectivity? Or to treasury or global expansion? Uh, but in uh, in general, cloud is a big market. There's a lot of um, different uh, opinions on cloud. Yeah. Key thing to understand is what is going to be transacted over the cloud? Who has the access to the data? What kind of data security is being put in the cloud? How is your connectivity to the cloud? Is it going to be private cloud? Is it going to be publicly accessed? These are all some of the questions that have to be addressed when you're looking at cloud solutions, whether by ERP vendors or treasury vendors or anybody for that matter. So it's a very wide question that can take a discussion. <laughs> Erika? Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mohan, Margaret, Harry, and Frank, for your presentation today. To the attendees, we certainly hope this webinar has deepened your understanding of treasury operations and technologies in general. And once again, thank you to our sponsor, Axel Tree Solutions. As a final reminder, today's recording will be sent out to you in about a week's time along with the presentation. We look forward to welcoming you to another GT News webinar in the near future. Many thanks and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.